One of the amazing things about human potential is that it gives us the chance to become the strongest versions of ourselves. I'd like to welcome you to a journey of self-discovery and empowerment. Along this path, you will find the keys to unlocking your greatest potential. As we start this journey of change, it is important to remember that real power comes from within. Outside praise or financial things don't measure it. What does is how strong, resilient, and clear-headed we are on the inside. You need to tap into the source of promise that lies deep inside you if you want to become the strongest version of yourself. The goal is to use the power of resolve, discipline, and self-mastery to reach your biggest goals and dreams. Throughout history, many people have become famous by letting the power inside them shine. Their stories show how the human spirit can change things. From visionaries who tried to go against the grain to trailblazers who made new paths where none had existed before. As we start this trip together, let's let go of the things that hold us back, like fear and self-doubt. Let's be excited about all the options that are out there for us and fully commit to reaching our full potential. By doing this, we shine a light on the way to becoming our strongest selves. You have a current idea of who you are and a dream idea of who you could become. The second one is a picture of the person you want to be. Brian Tracy is about to give an important speech. Take it easy, write things down, and watch the whole movie to make sure you don't miss anything important that could change your life. The ideal self is made up of the traits of all the people, both men and women, you have admired throughout your life. That is, assuming you read biographies and autobiographies of real people instead of superficial ones about drunk rock stars and other people, when you read about wonderful people from poor beginnings like Madame Curie, Thomas Edison, or Mother Teresa, who went on to do great things, you start to want to be like them. You take on their traits as if they were a part of you by learning about their stories and qualities. So, when you're in situations that call for bravery, drive, or happiness, you picture yourself acting like the people you look up to. You develop a higher and clearer mental ideal as you read more stories about famous people. This goal becomes the model you use to judge your own progress. Then there is a dynamic conflict between the person you are now and the person you want to be. Becoming is very important. Know that someone who thinks they're great isn't really willing to get better. When someone thinks they are their best self, they often don't have the unconscious urge to be more like them. This is the reason why you should think about and talk about the people you respect. For many young people today, the worst thing is that they look up to heroes like divas, rock stars, basketball players, dancers, and more. Those are the people they look up to. You can also ask, who do they look up to? Who do they look up to? What do they talk about? What do they watch? Who do they play again? Who do they talk about? And so on. And that's not good for you because these people aren't good examples for kids. People shouldn't look up to them. When I was growing up and coming from a bad home, role models, mostly guys, uh, took me in and changed my life in big ways for the better. They became examples for me and I still look up to them after all these years. I remember that I wanted to be someone they would like. Someone once asked Somerset Mom why he wrote so much and he replied with the beautiful line that I think fits life. He said, I write to earn the respect of the people I respect. I've learned that's what we do in life too. The things we do are meant to earn the respect of those we value and make sure you don't lose their respect. There are many of us who would do terrible things and give up a lot to keep the respect of someone we value. It's very important to know whose respect you value, who matters the most to me, who do I really care about. Then you think about what you should or shouldn't do to get or keep this person's respect. You don't need to know them. They can be great people. What you think about yourself now is different from how much you like yourself, which is your self-ideal. Also, I found something interesting. This is your self-image, and this is your self-ideal. You are now the best person you could be. The two are constantly tense with each other. Your self-esteem goes up every time you do something in the present that fits with the person you want to be. You care more about and like yourself more. In the short run, your self-esteem goes down every time you do or say something that irritates, angers, or makes you irritable. Or every time you change from the person you really want to be. Since this is the case, Great people are always trying to change how they act to become more like the person they most admire. You like and respect yourself more every time you do something that makes you more like the best person you can be.
being the things that you know other people will respect. The things that the people you admire the most would show becomes a way of life. It's not small, but it's very big. The difference between how you see yourself and how you want to be is a big part of your self-esteem. If this gap gets smaller, it means you feel good about your self-worth. If it grows because you said or did something you don't like and are aware that you're not happy about it, your self-esteem will go down. Your self-esteem and confidence will go up if you try to be like your dream self. And when someone says nice things about you that make you feel like a better person, you're really happy because you know you're getting closer to your big goal. Before you can change how you think about yourself, you have to first see the change as something you want and need. Remember how we said that you have to really want to change a light bulb. You have to think that changing is good, something you want, and something you have to do if you want to reach your full potential. Being a very well-controlled, organized, and positive person is part of your self-concept. You might say, this is essential if I want to have the most influence in my circle, or even become a great salesman. If you see yourself as wanting to be very organized, and know that you need to be organized to do well in a competitive business, then you see it as both desirable and important. The thing that moves you forward is passion. Second, begin to picture yourself as you want to be. Think about it some more. The nice guy, John Aroff, made a program called The Inner Game of Financial Success. He got a call from a writer named Timothy Galway, who wrote Inner Tennis 30 years ago and has since written Inner Golf. What he says fits perfectly with what we're learning here. He said that, think like you're already a tennis world winner. If you want to get better at the game, think about how you would act if you were a world winner and then act like you are one. Interestingly, your ability gets better. If you pretend to be a world winner while you play tennis, you'll get better. Think that you're already a great player if you want to get better. Think about how much you like this. You'll get better at golf if you pretend that you're already a great player. He calls it the inner game of tennis. You can call it the inner game of golf. I told you about my friend who was really good at karate and helped them picture themselves being great at what they wanted to do. Do not be tense or worried. Instead, think of yourself as a winner and one of the best people. People have come to see you because you're so good at what you do. He did very well, got better grades, and won more events than he had before when he went up there. He said it was simple. It was easy because your mind orders everything you do so that it fits with this new picture. Start picturing yourself and make clear pictures in your mind. A picture you imagine is an order to your subconscious mind. When you picture yourself doing your best, your subconscious mind plans your actions and behaviors to match the picture you just fed it. It's almost like the picture is the command or the seed. And your thought is the garden. Your subconscious mind makes the action you think about happen. How people see themselves is a very interesting field of study. Imagine yourself being happy, successful, and full of confidence. As you think about these things, you will start to act in ways that match your mental picture. Of course, it's normal for you to act in this way. As we've already said, every time you visualize, your subconscious interprets it as a new command, as if you've done it again. Keep playing the image over and over again before every important event, and you'll be successful. I may be getting ahead of myself a bit, but your image needs to be clear, vivid, and exciting. In other words, the more clear your picture is of how you'll perform or how you'll look in the future, the faster it will come true. The most important thing is that it is bright. That's why you put the pictures of a house where you can see them when you go to look at it or take pictures of it. Read design magazines with pictures of beautiful homes or home and garden articles about beautiful homes or sunsets. Look at those pictures to feed your mind, almost like putting them into your mental computer. Finally, your mind's computer works hard to quickly find you the kind of home you want. I'll tell you a short story. A couple came to my talk in Edmonton. When I was living there, he was sent from Toronto, which is 3,000 miles to the east, to Edmonton, which is growing. While she was packing, they put their house on the market. He came first to find a house and meet new people. He began this process after going to my class in Toronto three or four years ago. After going to my class in Toronto, they started using this method. There was a scrapbook nearby, and they cut out pictures of pretty homes from magazines and stuck them in. This house was their dream home. After about three years, he was moved, but they, they kept adding pictures to the book while he was gone. One day, they saw an article in Better Homes and Gardens magazine about the perfect house. It was beautiful and had everything they wanted. The living room, the bathrooms, the views, the garden. 
The view from the front of the house over the valley, the beautiful landscaping inside, and the rooms on the second floor. They took this whole picture out and put it in their album. They would get out the book and open it every weekend, getting lost in the pictures to clear their minds. They imagined walking through that house, being in the living room, cooking in the kitchen, sleeping in the bedroom, and taking in the view from the house. Every week until he was sent back to Edmonton, they did this again and again. He got in touch with a few real estate agents. They told them about a house for better homes and gardens that wasn't available at that time, but would be offered by their company on Saturday. One of them wasn't interested, but the other told them about it. They agreed to let him show them the house if they were interested. They had dinner together after his wife got there Friday night. They had been dreaming of this house for three years. The next morning, the real estate agent picked them up at the Weston Hotel in downtown Edmonton and took them to the best part of town, West Edmonton, to see the house that looked like it was from Better Homes and Gardens. Oh my God, this is the house, they yelled as they walked in. The only house they saw was that one. And the next question was whether they could afford it. It turned out that the price, terms, down payment, and start date for moving in were all perfect. After a few months, they sold their house in Toronto, packed up, and moved into the new house where they stayed. At that time, they thought it was amazing because it was the house from Better Homes and Gardens that they had dreamed of having. Does it really work? Yes. This is the house. Does it work? I am in right now. There were 42 things on our list of things we wanted. In a house, we moved twice before we got to San Diego. We found 41 of the 42 things in this house when we got there. The missing item, number 42, was a built-in cleaning system. We, we hired a maid because of this. Does it work? Yes, and what do you need? A bit of paper. Your mother will give you a piece of paper if you can't pay for one. In any case, she wants you to leave the house. So, what do you look like? It's important that your picture is clear. The clearer it is, the faster it will come true. Affirmations are strong. Good things you say to yourself and really believe. The things you tell yourself and believe are the most powerful in the world, making promises. You have a lot of promise for the future. To put it another way, you mostly become what you tell yourself. If you say something over and over, it gets programmed deeper and deeper into your mind until it starts to show up in your life. For example, the man who wrote down 101 goals and saw them all come true in 12 years. I've heard stories like that before, but this one is really cool. You can use the three Ps to shape your affirmations. First, they need to be about you. The word I should always come first in a statement. I am there, I earn, I achieve, I weigh. Second, it needs to be good. I am responsible. I am a millionaire. Third, it needs to be in the present tense. I earn X amount of dollars a year. I weigh X amount of pounds. I drive a BMW. I live in a custom 3,500 square foot home. That's exactly what one of my grads did. In the past, he lost his job after the seminar, which he considered to be very bad. One of his goals was to live in a new custom 3,500 square foot home. In just one year, he had two different jobs, made more money, and was closing on the house. After a year, he came back to my class. He was completing the sale of the house. If it was a lovely custom-built home that the builder had chosen to sell instead of living in himself, does it really work? You can't be sure. But what if it does? Affirmations really do work. When you talk to yourself, always be nice. When you write down your goals, say them out loud. I, I, I earn this amount of money. I, I, I weigh this amount of pounds. I live in such a house. I have such a net worth. And more. It's important to say your mantras out loud. It's two or three times more powerful to say something out loud than to yourself. That's why football leaders say, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to beat them out loud before a game. It gets them more excited than then whispering it to themselves. This is what you should say to yourself or read out loud in front of a mirror. I like myself. I can do it. I feel great. When I say this out loud and share it with other people, I always say I feel great when they ask me how I'm feeling day or night. Even when I was getting treatment for cancer last year, it was still a very interesting time. I told people I felt great when they asked how I was. It might not have been fully true, but I told you the truth ahead of time. It is very important to speak out loud. Just saying your statement out loud makes it 80% more powerful. The sixth P takes on the job. 
Be the person you want to be by acting like you already are that person. Do what they say and how they walk. When salespeople go to see a client, I tell them to imagine that the client is very wealthy. This way they will really make an impact that they are worth $100 million. But one of their hobbies is going to see people for a friend who owns a business. Making sales calls is fun for them because it lets them meet new people. They act like they're worth a billion dollars and don't care if the person buys or not. They like to talk to them, find out what they need, and help them if they can, even if the customer doesn't buy. Because they are rich, they don't care much, they only do it for a friend. This mindset of, I am already rich, takes away the desperate sound in your voice. Take on the part. Act like you are already that person. Act like you're already well-known if you want to become well-known. Behave like you're already well-known. We already said that feelings will lead to actions, and actions will lead to feelings. Taking on the part, and walking, talking, and acting like the person you want to be will make you feel that way, and you will act that way. After that, the way you act will make you feel that way. This idea of reversibility is very strong. Make it seem like you're already great. If you want to feel something, you can act like you already have it. Fake it until you make it is what we say. Even if you only act like you have the quality, you will start to feel it in minutes. You will start to feel strong if you act like you are. You will start to feel happy if you act like you are happy. Finally, take on the role. The four are to picture, confirm, speak out loud, and act as if you have already reached your goal and are a huge success. As we get closer to the end of our trip, keep in mind that becoming the strongest version of yourself isn't easy. It takes determination, persistence, and a strong desire to grow as a person. Don't give up, though. Every step you take forward brings you closer to reaching your full ability. Enjoy the trip. Be happy about your wins and learn from your losses. That's because real power is made in the fire of experience. That you never lose sight of the amazing power that lives inside you as you continue to walk this road. You have the power to become unbelievably great and to change your fate in ways that fulfill your deepest desires. You have the courage, strength, and drive to get past any problem that stands in your way. So go out and do it with confidence. If you want to become the most powerful version of yourself, you need to accept your power, your potential, and the end. You can't be successful by yourself. With that in mind, let's talk about a few ways to build relationships. Most of these tips are for building business relationships, building contacts, building good working relationships with colleagues, vendors, prospects, future clients, present clients, and past clients, building relationships. But remember, we are all people regardless of our profession, and many of these tips work well for building other relationships too. Let's start with kindness. How kind should you be? As kind as you possibly can. Who should you be kind to? To everyone you come in contact with, from taxi drivers to hotel clerks, waitresses, store clerks, people on the street, people on the street, people in your office, and people at home. Be kind to everyone. And here's why. A kind word goes a long way. Somebody's having a bad day, and you don't know they're having a bad day. But somebody's really feeling bad, and you offer up a kind word, maybe it's just a friendly hello, how are you? Maybe it's just taking, uh, maybe it's just taking a minute or two to listen to what somebody has to say. But your few words of kindness or your few minutes of attention could turn somebody's day around, might make them feel more worthwhile, cared for. Be generous with your kindness. It'll go a long way. People will remember whether you know them or not. If you're in a crowded restaurant, and you're especially nice to the waiter. Guess what? He'll remember you next time you come in. And then guess what'll happen? You'll get even better service. When you give kindness, it's not gone, it's invested. It'll come back to you too, five, ten, one hundred times. Kindness, it's so important in every aspect of your life. It's so important in building good relationships with others. Now here's what else is important. Sensitivity. Being touched by the experiences of others, being sensitive to others, understanding the plight of others, opening up your heart and your mind and your attention to address the needs of others, the people you work with, the people you work with, the people you live with, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing if you can what's going on in their heart, 
If there's a problem, you've got to be sensitive enough to ask some questions. Not one question, but many questions. Sometimes you won't even get through to the root of the problem until you've gotten two or three questions deep. Most people won't reveal the problem on the first question. You say, Mary, how are you today? How are things? And she says, well, everything's okay. And you can tell by the way she said it that everything's not okay. And most of us don't want to come right out and say what the real problem is unless two criteria are met. Number one, we're talking to someone we can trust. And number two, we're talking to someone who really cares. So sometimes it takes that second question, maybe a third and maybe a fourth before trust builds and the person finally understands that you do care. Then they're willing to tell you what's really going on. What's really on their mind? What's really on their mind? Gosh, that saves so much time asking questions up front. Did you ever talk for an hour and then ask a question? Found out that you just wasted the previous hour? Learn to ask questions that will build the trust and communication between you and those you work with. Learn to express, not impress. If you want to touch somebody, express sincerity from the heart. Impress builds a gulf. Express fills a bridge. Identification. You want to be able to relate your thoughts, philosophies, and experiences to someone who'll say, Me too, I know what you mean. You don't want their reaction to be, so what? If you're meeting someone for the first time, you're simply getting acquainted, making contact. Here's where you start. Find something you have in common. Find something you can both identify with. Start with where they are before you try taking them where you want them to go. So if you're trying to talk to somebody who's been stricken in the heart and you've had this experience, you can talk about being stricken in the heart and it'll mean something, it'll have substance, it'll have depth. And if you start there and then start building the bridge, you have identification. Then you start building rapport. And when you start building rapport with someone or when you want to enhance the rapport you have with someone, you need effective communication skill. You'll need the skills that'll help you work better with others to achieve their goals and achieve your goals. You need effective communication skills, patience. Let me give you a few tips on good communication. Because to be able to get along well with others, to be able to work well with others, to be able to live well with others, to be able to live well with others, you must be a good communicator. Number one, have something worth saying, interest, fascination, sensitivity, and knowledge. Number two, now that you've got something worth saying, number two is say a well. And you've got to be able to translate it so it'll benefit someone. You must have a good delivery system for your substance and knowledge and awareness and understanding and experience. Learn to say it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. The best communication occurs when both people are sincere, one sincerely wishing to learn or listen, and the other sincerely wishing to share. Number two in saying it well is repetition. Part of saying it well is simply practicing to say it well. Practice, practice. Part of what I teach in sales training is practice, practice. You start with something simple and when you don't know much about what you're doing, practice is even more important. Let's say you're in sales and your presentation is not that good and you wander around saying you wouldn't want to buy this, would you? I'm telling you maybe if you say that often enough during the day, somebody might say, well, maybe I would. What are you selling? Now you can't say, mind your own business. No, once you've opened the door, you've got to go through it. Here's what happens if you practice the sales. You're bound to make sales. Somebody will say, what are you selling? And you've got to tell them. Maybe they'll want it. You're bound to get better. If you practice, you'll get better. You'll get better at your sales presentation. You'll get better at listening to your prospect. You'll get better at listening to your prospect. You'll get better at closing the sale. You'll get better at earning a living. Practice is just as valuable as a sale. Because here's what's valuable in sales. The skills. The sale will make you a living. The skills will make you a fortune. So practice your presentation and your ability to communicate what you know. The people out there who say, no, I wouldn't care for any, are just as valuable. Why? Because they took the time to let you practice your presentation. And especially when you're just getting started, you might want to pay them to listen to you practice while you stumble around. So be thankful for the notes. Practice helps you develop skills. Skills make labor more valuable. If you just sell, you can make a living. If you skillfully sell, you can make a fortune. If you just talk, you can hold a family together. If you skillfully talk, you can build dreams in the future. The difference is skill. You can cut a tree down with a hammer, but it takes about 30 days. 
If you trade the hammer for an axe, you can cut the tree down in about 30 minutes. The difference between the 30 minutes and 30 days is the tool. And your best communication tool is your skill. So practice to get the skill of saying it well. Part of saying it well is sincerity. The next part is repetition. Now, here's another part of saying it well. Brevity. Sometimes you don't need too much. Just enough. The more you know, here's what I found out. The more you know, the briefer you can be. Because you can learn to make words more effective. Jesus was brief when he was putting his team together. He just wandered around the countryside and every once in a while, he'd see somebody he wanted on his team and said, You follow me. Now that's short. That's brief. Now why could Jesus be so brief and yet be so effective? Here's what I think. For all that he was that he didn't have to say. For all that he was that he didn't have to say. When you become bigger, when you become wiser, when you become stronger, you become a person of better reputation. So that when you arrive, maybe your reputation has preceded you. And when you get there, you don't have to say much. You don't have to launch into a two-hour harangue. If your reputation has preceded you, your reputation will get a lot of the job done for you before you ever arrive. Next is style. Part of saying it well is style. Be a student of style, a variety of styles, then make sure you develop your own. Be a student, but develop your own. Be a student, but develop your own. Don't be someone else. Let someone else influence you, but don't become them. Develop your own style. Here's another tip on saying it well. Vocabulary. You just got to have a good vocabulary to say it well. Vocabulary, we can only translate for other people with the tools called vocabulary. If you're lacking in vocabulary, then you're lacking in tools to describe some problem or some answer. Words, vocabulary, you can't communicate without them. And you can't communicate without them. And you can't communicate well without a defined vocabulary. Every time you come across a word that's new to you, what should you do? Look it up. Every time you're in a conversation and the other person uses a word that's new to you, look it up. Now, most of the time, you can figure out the meaning of a new word by how it's used. But if you can't, make sure you hold your response until you know for sure. Several years ago, some of my friends took a survey among prisoners, some rehabilitation program they were working on, and they weren't looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a relationship between vocabulary and behavior. Interestingly, this is what they found. The more limited the vocabulary, the more the tendency to poor behavior. Wow, when you stop to think about it for a moment, it makes sense. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. It gives us insight. And only with your present vocabulary can you see. You can't. You can't use tools. You don't have to see to create light, understanding, awareness, comprehension, perception, vision. You can only have as much vision as your present vocabulary will give you. And if you're limited in vocabulary, then you can't see very well. What if a person could only see the world through a little tiny hole? Can you imagine the mistakes he'd make in judgment? He'd say, here's how it is, and you'd say, no, that's not how it is. The eye says, but I can't see it. How come he can't see it? How come he can't see it? He doesn't have the vocabulary to understand the translation. Now, vocabulary is also what we use as a tool to express what's going on in our heart, what's going on in our head, to translate our questions, translate our questions, translate our answers, our perceptions, what we see, to be able to say it. And I'm telling you, if you have a limited way of translating and expressing what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your head, you'll fall way behind. So, you have twin problems without a good vocabulary. Number one, you wouldn't be able to see. Number two, you wouldn't be able to express and your world would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Not having the vision, not having the tools. Finally, you wouldn't need a place much bigger than 10 by 12 to live. Why? That's about as big as some people's world is. That's all they've got. This little arrow world making mistakes every day. Why they can't see getting it wrong every day. They can't comprehend. They can't understand. No tools with which to translate for good communication. Number one is having something good to say. Number two is saying it well. There. And number three is reading your audience. You've got to read what's going on between you and the people you're talking to. Should you say what you're saying a little softer? Should you say it a little stronger? Should you explain it more? Should you be more clear and concise? Should you quit? 
A lot of the decision making that's going on during a conversation with someone depends on how well you can read. How well you can tell what's going on in the minds of those you're trying to reach. Doesn't matter if you're looking into the face of a child or the face of a colleague or a thousand faces in an audience. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to pay attention. So let me give you some ways to read. The first one is, you've got to read what you see. You've got to read what you see. Search the face of a child and see if you're coming across. See if they look perplexed. See if they're getting it. See if they can't get it. Body language tells us a lot. Look at how the people you're talking to are sitting, what they are doing with their hands, their eyes. The guy's got his arms crossed, legs crossed, chin tucked down, and frowning. You've got your work cut out for you. This guy's not going to be easy to reach. The lady standing up from behind her desk, you've got to hurry. He's not going to listen to much more. You've probably got to pick up the pace and get down to it. So the first one is read what you see. Here's the second one. Read what you hear. You've got to be a good listener to be a good communicator. Get some feedback. Listen. To be a good parent, you've got to be a good listener. To talk well, you've got to listen well. That's so valuable. Get the feedback. Now what you hear may help you change gears. Be a little stronger, be a little softer, find a different illustration. This one isn't working. Search for another way to say it. Become sensitive to someone else's words, not just by preparing to talk when the other person's through. Listen. Pick up those signals that the feedback of words gives us. Here's the third way to read your audience, and that is to read how you feel. Emotional signals, you've got to learn to pick those up, pick up those feelings. Women just seem to have this part built in. Men can learn it, but women have it. A woman says, it doesn't feel right, just doesn't feel right. Man says, what does that mean? It doesn't feel right. She says, it's something. He says, something, what is this something? She says, I'm telling you something doesn't feel right. Now men can learn it, but women have it. Learn to read your emotion, learn to read what others are feeling. So you can adjust your communication, so you can adjust your approach, so you can adjust your approach, so you can get your message across, so you can communicate well. My belief is that about 80% of success or failure, maybe 90%, is caused by either clarity or lack of clarity. The successful people have one common characteristic. They're all very clear about who they are and what they want, and they have clear, written plans to achieve their goals in each key area of their life. Unsuccessful, unhappy people who are troubled by stress and anxiety are very unclear about who they are and what they want. And so therefore, they move from pillar to post. They're uh, not off-center very, very easily by unexpected events. So what we do in Focal Point is we start off with the principle of clarity, and we teach how to achieve clarity in the seven key areas of life. The first area is business and career, in uh, family and personal relationships, what it is you want and, and how you can get it, in financial life, how do you achieve financial independence specifically, health and fitness, how you live to 80 or 90 years old, and then we talk about clarity with regard to personal and professional development goals, social and community contribution goals, and inner and spiritual development goals. So therefore, what a person gets is a complete approach to life with clarity in each of the seven areas, and then they all fold together so that they work in harmony with each other. Most successful people in our society work in four or five days a week. They took two or three days off. They take long vacations. They go home at night. They get vastly more done when they work than the average person. Whereas the average person feels overwhelmed with work. Too much to do. Too little time. Completely uh, attacked on all sides by all kinds of conflicting responsibilities. And they can't understand why some people seem to be doing so much better than they are. People who are doing more nearly well. They're only five and ten times as much as other people in their fields. And they take lots of vacations. They're relaxed. They're fit. They play golf and tennis. They go to Hawaii or the Caribbean. And you say, how can these people be doing so well and yet be working less than people who are blowing their brains out? And the answer is that they're focusing in on the few things that they can do that contribute the greatest value and they just simply outsource, delegate, eliminate everything else. And as a result, they have lots more time off in their personal life, and they make much more when they work. I realize that all of life is the result of accumulation. And we call this the process of continuous improvement. 
So we found that if you get a little bit better every day, almost in medically measurable, and a little bit better every week, and a little bit better every month, over time, like a snowball, it accumulates to a huge amount. And it worked out that if I could become one-tenth of one percent better per day, five days a week, I'd be half a percent better at the end of the week. If I did this for four weeks in a row, I'd be two percent better at the end of the month. If I did this for an entire year, I'd be 26 percent better. 52 weeks times half a percent is 26 percent better. If I did this, and it compounds, because I compound interest, if I did this for 2.7 years, I'd be twice productive. And if I did it for 2.7 years more, I'd be twice as productive again. If I did it for 10 years, I'd be 10 times more productive. Began to go to work, and we teach this in Proko Park. Began to go to work on the most important things that I could get better at. And using my time better, and being more focused, and being more punctual, and, and being a setting better priorities, and learning more things. Well, do you know what happened? I increased my income by 10 times in about three and a half years. And the next seven years, I increased my income by 10 times more. So that after 10 years, I was earning not more, not just 10 times as much, but 100 times what I was earning when I started. And I've taught this to people all over the world. And they, do, and they come back to me and they say, after a few years, I said, that's incredible. After five years, I'm earning 10 times what I was earning. Next year, I'll be earning 12 times. And, and I need and you seven times, eight times, nine times. If you get just a little bit better every day, by design, not by chance, the cumulative effect in your life is extraordinary, and this explains the great success. All men and women start with nothing and achieve greatness. Basic time management rule is the 80-20 rule, which says that 80% of your results will come from 20% of your actions, your work. So therefore, what we help people do right from the beginning is to say, what are the 20% of your activities that contribute 80% of the value of all your work? Let me give you an example. A businessman will say that 80% of my sales are coming from 20% of my customers. However, it also means that 80% of my expenses are coming from the 20% of my customers, or the 80% of my customers represent only 20% of my business. So what they do is they fire all the customers, keep the top 20%, the ones who they make the most money, the ones who are the happiest, the ones who complain the least, the ones who pay their bills the most rapidly. And then they say, how can we get more customers like these ones in the top 20%? And suddenly their business doubles and triples, their profits go up, their costs go down, the amount of money and time spent servicing customers diminishes. Everything changes and changes sometimes in a matter of 30 days. Wow, that's an insatisfaction rules. Yes, of course, one of the things I tell people is only sell to people that you like and enjoy. And get rid of anybody else that you don't like and enjoy. Encourage them to go and ruin your competitor's business. And ruin your competitor's peace of mind. And people say, well, how can you do that? Well, when you start off in business, you're desperate, so you sell it to anybody who will buy. But as you get further along, you realize, hey, wait a minute, a lot of the customers that I'm servicing today are not really great customers. If I had a choice, I wouldn't have them. Good, you have a choice. Help them go somewhere else. Right. And use that same energy and concentrate on those customers that are worth five and ten times as much to you as the ones that complain and don't pay the bills. Last month, a woman came through the course. She went to her boss and she said, what do I have to do to double my income? He said, well, we have to restructure the work so that you did more and more of this and none of these other things. She said, well, if I do more and more of this and get these results, can you pay me twice as much? He said, you do it, I'll pay you twice as much. She couldn't believe it. That doubled her income in one meeting. Because bosses remember today, if they're worth anything, pay on the basis of results, not hours. So if you can offer to contribute twice the results by working on the things that you do really well and get rid of everything else, most bosses will pay you on what the heck. Then you make a list of everything you do. And let's say you do 10 or 15 things. And you ask yourself this question. If I could only do one thing on this list and do it really, really well, what one task or activity would make the greatest contribution to my work? And then you say, well, if I just did that more and more and none of the other things, I could earn twice as much, contribute twice as much as I'm contributing today. So you go to your boss and you say, boss, you know, I've looked over this. And I found if I could just do this all day long and do it really well, which I'm committed to do, I could contribute twice as much value. And your boss, who hasn't thought about it, will say, yes, that's true. If you did that all day long and did it really well, you say, well, could I get twice as much money? He says, sure, sure. They, you, if you do it, you see, many people think, well, I want you to pay me twice as much on the off chance that I will carry out my um, offer to you. No. What you do is you say, if I do this, will you pay me twice as much? I said, sure, there's nothing to lose. Because you're going to have to contribute vastly more to do it well 
boss will say, sure, I'm a boss. I own three companies. If somebody comes to me and says, look, I'll double the sales. I'll double the profitability. If you pay me twice as much, I say, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no profit. No lose proposition. No, right? <laughs> Great. You know, another concept you talk about that really uh, got me thinking was this idea of zero-based thinking. And many people have heard that applied to looking at a business. Um, can you talk about it, though? Number one, what is zero-based thinking? And how do you apply it to your personal life? Really help to reach therein. Well, I think that zero-based thinking is perhaps the finest thinking tool that a person can have for the rest of their life. And it's very simple. You look at any part of your world and you ask yourself, is there anything that I'm doing today that knowing what I now know, I wouldn't start up again today if I had to do it over again today? Well, it's a very simple question. And the way that you can tell if you have a zero-based thinking situation in your life is stress. It's wherever you experience chronic stress. That means stress that nags at you day in and day out. You say, with this person, situation, job, activity, knowing what I now know, would I start it again if I had to do it over? And if the answer is no, I wouldn't, then the next question is, how do you get out and how fast? Because th there's a rule that things left to themselves get go from bad to worse. They don't just clear up. It's amazing how many people are sitting in a bad situation hoping that things will just clear up. They'll get better. Someone will come along and resolve the situation. It'll go away. So I say there's three key areas. Ask yourself, is there any relationship in your life, business or personal, that knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get into? Most of our stress in life comes from unhappy relationships that aren't working out. That's at work or health. And then if there is, then the question is, how do you get out of this and how fast? Because there's a rule that we teach is that people don't change. People are what they are. They've always been that way. They'll never be any different. So don't hang all of your hopes for happiness on the off chance that somebody might change. Because they're not going to change. That's the way they are. The second area we say is with regard to your business. Is there any product or service? Is there any process or expense or advertising or anything that you're doing today that knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get injured? Let me give you an example. One of our students, he was commissioned by his company to uh, find a way to improve the efficiency of their nationwide network of warehouses. And so he knew nothing about it, but he went in. His starting point was, should we have all these warehouses in the first place? And the way he found, because of Federal Express, because of UPS, because of flights and everything else, when the company started, they needed 12 warehouses to cover the country. However, he recommended that instead of improving the efficiency of the warehouses, they get rid of 10 of them, have one warehouse square in the middle of the west in Denver, one warehouse square in the middle of the east in, say, Memphis or Atlanta, that service the whole country, get rid of all the others, and dramatically increase their efficiencies, which they did, and they saved $275 million. Now, keep asking, in any part of your life, should we be in this area at all? And if not, how do we get out and how fast? And you're also well known for acronyms, and uh, perhaps the best acronym that I found that described focal point was the Grand Slam. The word slam is the key. It has four letters, S-L-A-M, which stands for Simplify, Leverage, Accelerate, and Multiply. Now, Simplify means that you're constantly looking for ways to simplify your work and your personal life. We show that every additional step in any process dramatically increases the complexity of the process and the length of time it takes to do it. So we show people a whole new way of thinking in terms of simplification. And there's much more to it than that. The second is leverage. How do you leverage yourself? How do you leverage yourself times other people, times other people's knowledge, times other people's money, times other people's energy, times other people's skill, and so on? Because all successful people leverage themselves. They use it themselves, leverage against other people to get vastly more done than the average person. The third letter, accelerate, means do it faster. We find that you can do a task slowly or quickly with the same level of quality. So we find that all successful people move fast. All unsuccessful people move slowlier when they get around to it. And the fourth letter is multiple. How do you multiply yourself? How do you delegate? How do you outsource? How do you eliminate? How do you downsize? How do you use every resource in your environment to multiply your ability? And these are the four keys, simplify, leverage, accelerate, and multiply, that enable people to go from rags to riches in one generation. We teach a complete process of time management that's a little bit different from other people, but it basically forces you to think through everything you have to do before you begin. Other than that, you'll have a tendency to react impulsively.
If you react impulsively, you'll find yourself spending more and more time on items of less and less value. And pretty soon the day is gone and you haven't accomplished anything of importance. So therefore, the key to acceleration is to be very clear about what's most important and then do it quickly and do it now. In times of rapid change, you also have times of great turbulence, which means that all bets are off all the time. But one of my favorite lines is that uh, in this modern economy, you have to be willing to throw out all your assumptions every three weeks because things are changing so quickly. One new piece of information can totally change all of your thinking. One new competitive strategic step with a new product, a new service, a new advertisement, a slash price can totally change what you do in your business. So you can spend weeks and months coming to a conclusion, but some external event can force you to change quickly to survive. And that's why flexibility means you've got to be willing to constantly be open to the possibility that you're on the wrong track. With new information, you've got to be open to the possibility that there's a better way that you have to change. And people who are flexible are far more open, far more creative, they're far more optimistic than people who are inflexible and rigid in their thinking. So again, the Manager Institute has said that flexibility is the most important single quality for success in the 21st century. Some years ago, we started a program in San Diego called the Focal Point Advanced Coaching and Mentoring Program. And what the program is based upon is really four keys. The first is clarity. And we find that if people become extremely clear about what they want in each area of their life and crystallize it into goals with standards of performance and action steps, they begin to move ahead in an incredible race. The second part that we teach in the coaching program is what we call a simplification, which is to simplify your life so that you can take vastly more time off. As you know, we call this the double-double formula, how you can double your income and double your time off at the same time. And it seems counterintuitive, as we talked about, because it's hard for people to think that by working less, I can earn more. But we do have people who come through our program, and we say that in a year to two years, you'll achieve this goal. Many of them achieve it in 30 days. Some people literally walk into the program and walk out and the next day literally transform their lives, simplify it dramatically, stop doing things that are of no value, just cut them off like a meat clear chunk, just stop doing them, and then start focusing on getting better and better at the one or two things they do that pay them the most. As suddenly their incomes double and their time off increases dramatically. Their relationships with their families improve, the more time for health, patients, travel, it's almost amazing. One of the things that people have to understand is that the whole purpose of working is to support your ideal lifestyle. So in the first part of the program, Clarity, we help people to define what is my ideal lifestyle. If my lifestyle were perfect, if I had millions of dollars in the bank, I could do anything I wanted to do, what would it look like? And then we bring it right down to reality and we say, what steps could we take today to begin creating that perfect lifestyle? Then we show you how you can simplify. One of our principles is that the only way you can simplify your life is by stopping doing things. You can't do more things more efficiently and effectively. You have to stop things that are muddying up your life. The third principle we teach is what is called maximize. Well, how do you maximize your talents, abilities, skills, opportunities, so that you're getting the very, very most out of the energy that you put in? Remember, some people work eight hours a day and make $25,000. Another person working in the same company, out of the same office, working with the same customers, will make $250,000. And they're selling the same product to the same people at the same price and the same conditions. They're working at desks next to each other. One person makes 10 times as much as the others. Why? That's what we explain. Let me show you how to do it. And the final part is what I call leverage. How do you leverage yourself? How do you get the very most of every part of your life? And the, the coaching process is, is really interesting because People, first of all, do pre-work. In other words, they ask, answer a series of questions so they come fully prepared. And then they do eight hours of work with me and other very successful people. And they come out with an action blueprint, which they then follow for the next three months. Then they come back after three months and do it again. What happens is that within one year, people's life transforms. Sometimes, as I say, within 30 days, sometimes in 24 hours. <laughs> because for the first time, it's like somebody ran inside their brain and turn on all the lights of their possibilities. Suddenly they can see themselves in their life better than ever before. So one of my favorite stories, which is in the program, is, uh, is a gentleman, an old friend of mine, working his heart out 12, 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week, 
and never spent any time with his family. Hadn't taken a vacation in four years. He came through the focal point process. His arms were folded. Very skeptical that it's possible to work less and, and make more money. But he realized that it was true, and so he did what all superior people do, is he acted on new information. Most people will hear what we talk about and not act on. But the very best people will take it and run with it, like a football player catching a fumble and running for yards. Well, he went back and he analyzed his clients. He realized that he, it was not 80-20, it was 90-10. About 90% 90 of his business was coming from 10% of his clients. So he decided to just draw a line at the 20% mark, took his bottom 80% of clients and began to parcel them out like dealing cards to other small companies that could service them better. He began then to really focus on his top clients and to really work them, excuse the word, for referrals. Who else do you know in your level would be interested in working with me and my company? And you know what? They said, I'm glad you asked because I've been willing to tell you for years, you just never asked. So he began getting referrals, like a frog jumping from lily pad to lily pad. He began getting referrals from top people to top people to top people. In less than six months, he tripled his income. He increased his time off to one week per month. He started taking vacations with his family. He started exercising again. He just lost 22 pounds. He literally transformed his life and his income went up by three times. There is a single secret of success. And it is this. Do what you resolve to do. Do what you have decided to do. Fulfill your promises to yourself. If you say you're going to get up early in the morning and exercise, just do what you said you would do. If you say you're going to save, then save your money. If you say you're going to write down your goals, do it. If you're going to listen to audio programs in your car, just darn well do what you resolve to do. Complete, fulfill your commitments to yourself and your whole life will be wonderful. Use of time is to uh, work intently on something that need not be done at all. And one of the things that is holding back entrepreneurs, business owners, is killing them, by the way, and it's wiping out an entire generation, is this obsession with technology. I, I see people that are walking with their phone. It's almost like drug addicts, their mainline. The fact is that this obsession with looking at the screen and staying connected, killing people. Because it, it stops them from focusing. Warren Buffett was at a dinner party, Bill Gates, and Bill Gates Sr. And they were talking together. Because Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are good friends. And Bill Gates' father, very, very successful. And somebody came. That's down and excuse me for interrupting you, but we've just been noticing talking. Now we had a question. What would you say is the most important for And if all three turned to him, said the same words. Focus. Focus. That's why. So concerned about the well, be attraction, distract. It is so disturbing because it guarantees failure to actually become addicted to distraction. If you have, if you are addicted to, and if you can't focus on dancing. And so distraction, technological distraction, they is destroying your hopes for future is keeping you busy and at the end of the day you become and you're exhausted. You really thought of how much and the action is about 80%. And the rest of the time, by the end of the day, you're too to do anything. What? Do the really important thing. Where you're recently what? The end of the day, of a typical day today, average person IQ has decreased that means throughout a distracting day, you get stupider all day long. And by the end of the day, you're just stupid. Stimulates your so much. What happens, every stimulus triggers dopamine, and dopamine has, it has the same effect as cocaine on your brain. It's a stimulus. You cannot not watch your computer. I mean, many people get up in the middle of the night to see if there's any email, any spam. And then they go back to bed. Say, so ask, I ask my business, do you invest? Well, wow. if that's what your business is, then do you spend all of your time? You know what the average business owner today is only 11% of their time. All the rest. Is and they don't even realize it until somebody follows them around. It. So I'll give you a very simple way to double your income. Here it is. So when you start in the morning, be thinking, check your computer or your... 
something that is don't. Rule for success today is lead thing. So if you're the reason you're in business to generate sales, that is, and all you do for the first 90 minutes, it's about to do revenue generation, value creation. Then you take a 15 minute break. And then you start again and do another 90 minutes. All you do is value creation. So that's the reason why you're working this and yourself to that. Do anything but that. Three hours. We don't turn on our computer. I'll never. But I do that. People will go crazy because it's like taking dopamine. People who are addicted, they go into convulsions. And they will go into convulsions. But you'll have to do it yourself. You'll have to go through your own convulsions. You'll have we live in a world where focus is more valuable than even your intelligence. An addiction to distraction will be the death of your creative production. If you watch most performers today, you watch most people in business today, you watch most people in your community today, they are addicted to the entertainment of video games. They are spending the best hours of their days watching dancing cats. They are wasting their human potential hooked into some social platform that is creating empires for other people. They're not living their human potential. They're not living their economic potential because they're hooked to a screen. It is the most frightening time in the history of the world and it's the most gorgeous time in the history of humanity. Most people are lost. Most people are hooked. If you want to achieve the results only 5% achieve, you've got to think and produce and behave like only 5% of the people on the planet. And the best people on the planet in terms of creativity and productivity are not spending their finest hours addicted to distraction. They're doing real work. And so I want to walk you through a number of protocols that will really help you multiply your productivity in the finest of work for the next 90 days. Then the first 90 minutes of your workday on your single most game-changing opportunity. And research has shown that the morning hours are when you have the most focus, when you have the most energy, and when you have the most willpower. And so you want to use that first 90 minutes, the second piece of technology to create exponential productivity, is what I call tight bubbles of total focus. Your environment is so important. If you look at B performers or C producers, they really don't pay a lot of attention to their environment. And so they get very distracted. There's lots of noises. Phones are going off. Maybe there's news in the background. Maybe there's me messy environments all around them. Maybe there's toxic people. The way I run my work life on certain days, I am very hard to read. And I see a lot of people not judging them, it's just observing them. Every time their phone rings, they check it. Or they have, you know, these loud notifications. So they're constantly being distracted. If you are being distracted by notifications, checking your phone, checking your Twitter feed, checking your Facebook feed, looking on Instagram, checking all the different platforms, that is going to destroy your focus. What I do it is I have certain days I label as creative days. And on those creative days, I actually go device free. And on those days, I go to certain places Call them my Menlo lab, and that's where I do my best work. So install where you will do your best work and get your best. The next piece of technology that will help you create exponential productivity in your work life is choose your peer group really, really well. If you want to be a high performer in terms of your product productivity, populate your life with high performers. Now here we are in the modern world, and what happens? Subconsciously, we are modeling the behavior people we spend most of our time with. You're down around people who are mediocre performers. You will subconsciously start behaving like them. Why else is it important to surround yourself with a peer set or a social orbit of gay players? Emotional contagion. You're around a social circle of people who are inspired, people who want to do great work, people who want to be ultra productive, people who want to be innovative. People who are relentlessly optimizing their work, their thinking, their creativity, just being around them will allow you to adopt their energy and their ways of being. And then the final technology for you to create exponential productivity is what I call learned minimalism. Now, I've worked with a lot of the most creative and productive people on the planet. If you look at the greatest empire builders economically, Musk, Steve Jobs, great example. 
You know, he lived in a pretty simple house, even when he was a multi-billion. He was only about a few things, my favorite things in life. Books and cities. If you look at a great artist, they didn't fill their work days and their personal lives with a lot of things. They filled them with a few things. And if you look at any great artist, any great entrepreneur, any great build, business builder, any great author, any great humanitarian, they were monomaniacally focused on one thing. They were minimalist. And so what I want to leave you with is this. Maybe this year, rather than having 50 projects that you want to achieve at the highest level, maybe pick three. This year, rather than trying to read 20 audiobooks, 50 ebooks, go to five courses, I am encouraging you to really adopt this thinking protocol of becoming a minimalist. Even your home, fill it with just a few things. Even your work life, few projects. Even your clients, just the highest leverage clients. Got to identify your target. Nothing stand in your way. If you don't keep your mind on what you're doing, you don't take focus. Fast and then, could right on by. Whatever you're supposed to be doing for the moment, do it. Can't be thinking of everything you have to do at one time, all the time. You have to concentrate on just one thing at a time, one project, one job. You don't, you won't accomplish it. It's a lot of discipline not to answer the phone every time it rings at home. Concentrate on the work at then demand of you the discipline they fall. If you have a long list of things to get done within a day, hit the toughest ones while your concentration is at its. Don't let your mind wander. Stay focused. You never know what important points you When you recognize the need to concentrate more, when you recognize the need, when you discipline yourself to focus, it will come easier and easier. Focus concentration can be learned. Focus, concentration, become a habit. Work on it a little every day. Open yourself to be where you are. Work at work and play at play. Wherever you are, be there. Constant. If you do not have clear, specific goals for your life, don't tell me. You wish your life was better because you're lying to me and you're lying to yourself. There are four major obstacles to goal setting. Uh, is the fear of rejection or criticism. Here's the key to goal setting. Don't tell anybody. When you set goals, the only people you discuss your goals with are the people who also have goals, who will encourage you with your goals, and will tell you that your goals are attainable and that you can do it. Now. The second reason that people don't set goals is people don't know how. People think, well, you just write down what you want to do. Well, that's helpful, but it's not enough. The third reason, C, is that people don't realize the importance of goals. If you've been brought up in a family where goals were not constantly emphasized, if you associate with people who don't talk about and work on goals all the time, you can actually drift along not even aware that goals are central to success in life. The last is fear of failure. We very carefully protect ourselves from these feelings of low self-esteem. And how do we do that? We sabotage ourselves unconsciously by not setting goals for ourselves. So, we can't fail. If you don't set goals for yourself, you can't succeed either. So the ability to set goals and to make plans for their accomplishment is the master of success. If you master all other skills, this, your life will be diminished to that degree. It just means that your life will be diminished dramatically compared to what it could be. Now, desire. And this is where we start. Desire is the only real limit to your abilities. The only question you ever have to ask is, how badly do you want it? If you want it badly enough, key word for success is hungry. Here are the two keys with regard to desire. Uh, it must be personal. You can't say, I want someone to love me. You cannot set a goal for another person. You want to be in a perfect relationship. So what you do is you describe your perfect relationship. You sit down and you make a list of the perfect person 
as though you were going to hire someone to run your company. And you make a list of the perfect person and you describe them in detail. Height, weight, size, education, experience, personality, background, temperament, interests, enthusiasm, leisure time, activities, everything. I have given this exercise to countless people when they were single and they've been astonished at how fast they met the perfect person. The very act of crystallizing it by writing it down, by deciding what you want and writing it down, activates this force field of attraction and starts to draw that person into your life. Same with business relationships. B. They must be burning, intense, passionate. In fact, when you are working on your major definite purpose, there's a measure. And you know what it is. You become very impatient with the physical need of having to sleep. It makes you impatient so you're always structuring your time so that you are sleeping the amount that you need but only that because you want to get up and get going the next stage. Number two is belief. If you have a belief that you don't deserve success or if you have a belief, am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Do I deserve success? You're going to have opposing goals and opposing beliefs. So let's say if your goal is to make $100,000, but your belief is that you only deserve to make $50,000, you're going to be out of sync or out of vibration, and they'll basically cancel each other out. Or you'll do a little bit of hard work, and then you'll sabotage your success, or you'll think you can achieve it for a day or two. So belief is absolutely important. If you absolutely important, if you absolutely believe it, you will walk, talk, think, feel, behave, and get results consistent with your beliefs. If you feel confident, you act confident. But if you don't feel confident, act confident. And it will cause you to feel confident. Now, number three, write it down. You pull them out of the air where they have no substance at all, and you write them down on paper. And when you write a goal down, you engage in what is called a psycho neuro motor activity. You activate your visual powers, your audio powers, and your kinesthetic powers. And whatever you write down, only 3% of Americans have written goals. And you know something. Everybody works for them. Everybody works for them. The fourth key is to determine all the reasons why you want the goal. One of the big thrusts for success is to come up with a strong enough why. If the why is powerful, the how is easy. You've got to have your own list of reasons if you want to be successful because you have 10 or 15 or 20 or 50 or 100 or 300 things you want to do with your success, you will be like a force of nature. Now, the fifth key is to analyze your starting position. You can't go from rope to buckets of money. You have to demonstrate that you can be a master over small amounts of money. You'll get bigger amounts by uh, a law of attraction. Remember the reality principle? What's the reality? You get on the scales and you weigh yourself and you weigh yourself and you honestly admit, this is where I am. If you want to be fit, you go down and you take a fitness test. Number six, set a deadline. Uh, and as Nian once said that your subconscious can work against you because when you set a big goal, you're disrupting your subconscious. So your subconscious mind will attempt to sabotage you. It tells you, ah, uh, you can't achieve this goal. You don't need to write it down. It's okay as long as you know what it is. If your goal is big enough, set sub-deadlines. You may set a 10 or 20 year goal and then break it down year by year. So a person says, well what if you set a goal and you don't achieve your goal by the deadline? There... It's just a guesstimate that enables you to focus. We cannot live without deadline. If for some reason you don't achieve your goal by the deadline, simply set a new deadline, Number seven is identify the obstacles you will have to overcome. With regard to obstacles, there's always something that stands between you and your goal. If there are no obstacles, it is not a goal. It's merely an activity. Now there's a very powerful principle called the principle of constraints. What it says is that there's always one limiting factor or constraint or bottleneck between you and your goal that sets the speed at which you achieve your goal. You know, the 80-20 rule applies to constraints. Average people always blame their problems on external circumstances. Top people look inside themselves. The things that are holding you back are usually the lack of a skill, the lack of a quality like self-discipline, or the lack of a particular knowledge or skill, 
Only 20% of the reasons you're not achieving your goals are on the outside. So always start with yourself. Number eight is to identify the additional knowledge and skills that you'll need to achieve your goals. To achieve a goal that you've never achieved before, you will have to develop skills that you never had before. And here's the great breakthrough thought that changed my life. At the age of 23, all business skills are learnable. Ask yourself what one skill, if I was absolutely excellent at it, would help me the most to achieve my goal? Well, one skill would have the greatest positive impact on your life. What one skill would help you the most to achieve your most important goals? You say, woohoo, if I was good at that, I'd save myself years of hard work. People say, geez, it'll take me a week, a month, a year, two years to learn that skill. Life has always been hard. Life will always be hard. Life will always be hard. Only no hopers and thumb suckers and people with no future expect things to be easy. To accomplish great things, you have to work hard. Number nine, make a plan. Make a list of everything you'll have to do, and then organize the list. First of all, by sequence. And once you have a list organized by sequence and priority, you have a plan. Once you have the goal and the plan, the very act of completing them programs them into your subconscious mind. People with goals and plans accomplish 10 times as much as people without goals and plans. A thousand percent more than people without. So write down what you want, make it clear so the universe can help you get it. Number 10. Visualize. The most powerful faculty you have is the ability to imagine your goal as already created. See your goal as a reality every day. Your job is to give to the universe an absolutely crystal clear picture of the goal that you want, which you can only get by thinking it through and writing it down. Number 11 is back your goals and plans of persistence and determination. 95% of the goals that you will set for yourself in life you will attain as long as you persist, as long as you become unstoppable. The primary reason why people don't attain their goals is, first of all, they don't have them, and second of all, they stop. Your persistence is your measure of your belief in yourself. It's the way of your time. You persist, your belief intensifies. When your belief intensifies, your desire intensifies, your desire intensifies. When your desire intensifies, your motivation intensifies, which makes you even more driven to persist in the attainment of your goals. Every act of persistence strengthens you and increases your ability to persist even more. Everything you do builds habits of success that lock in deeper and deeper and which ultimately guarantee your success. Remember, there are no real limits on what you can accomplish except for the limits that you place on yourself. There's a direct relationship between the level of clarity you have about who you are and what you want and virtually everything you accomplish in life. Average people just throw themselves at life like a dog chasing a passing car and wonder why they never seem to catch anything or keep anything worthwhile. For your desire to be intense enough, your goals must be purely personal. They must be goals that you choose for yourself rather than goals that someone else wants for you or that you want to achieve to please someone in your life. In goal setting, for the process to be effective, you must be perfectly selfish about what it is that you really, really want for yourself. This simply means that in setting goals for your life, you start with yourself and work forward. One of the most important questions in goal setting is this. What do I really want to do with my life? When you begin, these will often feel a bit like fantasies detached from reality. However, now your job is to make them concrete, like designing a dream house on paper. You start with your general goals and then move to more specific goals. Many people make the mistake of overcomplicating goals and problems, but the more complicated the solution, the less likely it is to ever be implemented, and the longer the time it will take to get any results. Your aim should be to simplify the solution or go directly to the goal as quickly as possible. For example, many people tell me they would like to double their incomes. If they are in sales, I ask them, what is the fastest and most direct way to double your income? So after they've come up with a series of suggestions, I give them what I consider to be the best answer. Double the amount of time that you spend face to face with qualified prospects 
If you don't upgrade your skills or change anything else about what you are doing, but you double the number of minutes that you spend face to face with prospects each day, you will probably double your sales and double your income. According to studies that go back as far as 1928, the average salesperson today spends 90 minutes each day face to face with prospects. They organize their days efficiently to assure that they spend more minutes in the presence of people who can and will buy their products or services. 20% of what you do accounts for 80% of the value of all the things you do. In my advanced coaching programs, we teach our clients to identify those 20% of activities that contribute the most value and then do twice as many of them. Some of our clients double their productivity and subsequently their income in as little as 30 days with this approach, even if they've been working for many years in the same position. Always look for the simplest and most direct way to get from where you are to where you want to go. Look for the solution that has the fewest number of steps and most of all take action. Get going, get busy, develop a sense of urgency. The best ideas in the world are of no value until they're implemented. In determining your true goals, use the magic wand technique. Imagine that you have a magic wand that you can wave over a particular area of your life. When you wave this magic wand, your wishes come true. The magic wand technique is fun on the one hand, but quite revealing on the other. Whenever you imagine that you have a magic wand, your true goals in that area emerge. Here's another goal. Setting question that reflects your true values. If you learned today that you only had six months left to live, how would you spend your last six months on earth? Who would you spend the time with? Where would you go? What would you strive to complete? What would you do more of or less of? When you ask yourself this question, what comes to the top of your mind will be a reflection of your true values. Your answer would almost always include the most important people in your life. Very few people in this situation would say, well, I'd like to get back to the office and return a few phone calls. Is setting your true goals as an extension of imagining that you have no limitations, make up a dream list. If you have no limitations at all, Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, recommends that you sit down with a pad of paper and make a list of at least 100 goals that you want to accomplish in your lifetime. Then imagine that you have all the time, all the money, all the friends, all the abilities and all the resources necessary to achieve these goals. The amazing discovery you will make is that within 30 days after writing out this list of 100 dreams, remarkable things will begin to happen in your life and your goals will start to be achieved at a rate that you cannot even imagine today. Here's another goal. Setting question. If you want a million dollars tomorrow, cash tax, free, how would you change your life? The primary reason that we stay in situations that are not the best for us is because we fear change. But when you imagine that you have all the money that you'll ever need to do or be whatever you want, your true goals often emerge. Here's another question to help you clarify your true goals. What have you always wanted to do but been afraid to attempt? When you look around your world and you look at other people who are doing things that you admire, what have you always wanted to do as well but you've been afraid of taking the chance? Have you ever wanted to start your own business? Have you wanted to run for public office? Have you wanted to embark on a new career? What have you always wanted to do but been afraid to attempt? In setting goals for your life long and short term, you should continually ask yourself, what do I most enjoy doing in each area of my life? For instance, if you could do just one thing all day long in your work, what would it be? If you could do any job or full-time activity all the time without paying, what would it be? What would it be? What sort of work or activity gives you the greatest joy and satisfaction? One of your aims in life is to enjoy as many peak experiences as possible. You achieve this by thinking back and identifying those moments of peak experience in your past and then by imagining how you could repeat them in your present and future. What have been your happiest moments in life up to now? How could you have more of those moments in the future? What do you really love to do? You should have goals for social and community involvement and contribution as well. Think about what kind of a difference you would like to make in your world. What organizations causes, needs, or social problems would you like to work on or work in? What changes would you like to see in your world? Who is there who is less fortunate than you that you would like to help? If you are independently wealthy, what causes would you support? 
Most of all, what could you do today to begin making a difference in your world? Don't wait until some future date when everything will be ideal. Instead, start today, in some way. One of the most important areas of goal setting is your financial life. If you could earn and accumulate all the money you need, you could probably achieve most of your non-financial goals faster and easier than you can today. If your life were ideal, how much money would you like to earn each month, each month, each year? How much would you like to save and invest each month and year? How much would you like to be worth sometime in the future? What sort of estate would you like to accumulate by the time you retire? And when would you like that to be? Most people are hopelessly confused about their financial goals. But when you become absolutely clear about them for yourself, your ability to achieve them increases dramatically. When you are absolutely clear about what you want, you can then think about your goals most of the time, and the more you think about them, the faster they will materialize in your life. This process of asking yourself questions about your goals in each part of your life begins to clarify your thinking and makes you a more focused and definite person. Now, here are three things you can do immediately to put these ideas into action. First, write down your three most important goals in life right now. Second, if you want a million dollars cash tax, free tomorrow, what changes in your life will you make immediately? Third, if you could wave a magic wand over your life and have anything you wanted, what would you wish for? As Peter Drucker said, whenever you find something getting done, you find a monomaniac with a mission. Uh, the more you think about your major definite purpose and how to achieve it, the more you activate the law of attraction in your life. You begin to attract to you people, opportunities, ideas, and resources that help you to move more rapidly toward your goal and move your goal more rapidly toward your goal more rapidly toward yeah when you have a major definite purpose that you think about talk about and work on all the time your outer world will reflect this like a mirror image any thought plan or goal that you can clearly define in your conscious mind will immediately start to be brought into reality by your subconscious mind and your superconscious mind and your superconscious mind as we will discuss later Imagine that you decided that you wanted a red sports car. You write this down as a goal. You begin to think about and visualize a red sports car. This process sends the message to your reticular cortex that a red sports car is now important to you. This picture immediately goes up onto your middle radar screen. From that moment onward, you will start to notice red sports cars wherever you go. You'll even see them driving and turning corners several blocks away. You will see them parked in driveways and in showrooms everywhere you go. Your world will seem to be full of red sports cars. If you decided to buy a motorcycle, you would start to see motorcycles everywhere. If you decided to take a trip to Hawaii, you would begin to notice posters, advertisements, brochures, and television specials with information on Hawaiian vacation. Whatever goal message you send to your reticular cortex activates your reticular activating system to make you alert to all possibilities, to make you alert to all possibilities, to make that goal a reality. You will see stories in newspapers and recognize books on the subject wherever you go. You will receive information and solicitations in the mail. You'll find yourself in conversations about earning and investing money. It will seem as though you are surrounded by ideas and information that can be helpful to you in achieving your financial goals. On the other hand, if you do not give clear instructions to your reticular cortex in your subconscious mind, you will go through life as though you were driving in a fog. You will be largely unaware of all these opportunities and possibilities around you. You will seldom see them or notice them. Wherever your attention goes, your life goes as well. When you decide upon a major definite purpose, you increase your level of attentiveness and become increasingly sensitive to anything in your environment that can help you to achieve that goal faster. Your major definite purpose can be defined as the one goal that is the most important to you at the moment. It must have the following characteristics. First, your major definite purpose must be something that you personally really, really want. Your desire for this goal must be so intense that the very idea of achieving your major definite purpose excites you and makes you happy. Second, your major definite purpose must be clear and specific. You must be able to define it in words. You must be able to write it down with such clarity that a child could read it and know exactly what it is you want and be able to determine whether or not you've achieved it. Third, 
Their major definite purpose must be measurable and quantifiable. Rather than make a lot of money, it must be more like, I earn $100,000 per year by a specific date. Fourth, your major definite purpose must be both believable and achievable. Your major definite purpose cannot be so big or so ridiculous that it's completely unattainable at the moment. I made this mistake once myself when I was younger. When I first started setting goals, I set an income goal that was 10 times what I had ever earned in my life. After many months and no progress at all, I realized that my goal was not helping me because it was so far beyond anything I had ever achieved. It had no motivating power. In my heart of hearts, although I wanted it, I really did not believe it was possible. And since I didn't believe it was possible, my subconscious mind rejected it, and my reticular cortex simply failed to function. Don't let this happen to you. Fifth, your major definite purpose should have a reasonable probability of success, perhaps 50-50, when you begin. If you've never achieved a major goal before, set a goal that has an 80 or even 90% probability of success. Make it easy on yourself, at least at the beginning. Later on, you can set huge goals with very small probabilities of success, and you will still be motivated to take the steps necessary to achieve them. But in the beginning, set goals that are believable, achievable, and which have a high probability of success so that you can be assured of winning right from the start. Everyone wants to be a millionaire or a multimillionaire or a multimillionaire. The only question is whether or not you are willing to do all the things necessary and invest all the years required to achieve that financial goal. If you are, there is virtually nothing that can stop you. Take out a sheet of paper and write down a list of 10 goals that you would like to accomplish in the foreseeable future. Write them down in the present tense as though you had already achieved these goals. For example, you would write, I weigh X number of pounds or I earn X number of dollars per year. After you've completed your list of 10 goals, go back over the list and ask yourself this question. What one goal on this list, if I were to accomplish it immediately, would have the greatest positive impact on my life? At the same time, whatever goal you choose, write it on a separate sheet of paper. Write down everything you can think of that you can do to achieve this goal, and then take action on at least one item on your list. Write this goal on a 3x5 index card that you carry around with you and review it regularly. Think about this goal in the morning, noon, and night. Continually look for ways to achieve it, and the only question you ask is how your selection of a major definite purpose and your decision to concentrate single-mindedly on that purpose. Overcoming all obstacles and difficulties until it is achieved will do more to change your life for the better than any other decision you ever made. Whatever your major definite purpose, write it down and begin working on it today. Now, here are three things you can do immediately to put these ideas into action. First, answer the question, what one great thing would you dare to dream if you knew you could not fail? Second, make a list of 10 goals you would like to achieve in the months and years ahead in the present tense. Select the one goal from that list that would have the greatest positive impact on your life. And third, make a list of everything that you can think of to do that will move you toward your goal. Take action on at least one thing immediately 